So I guess the first thing we're doing uh, tonight is a bit of a panel discussion amongst the editors um, about the issue. I think it's going to be a bit of an exercise in cooperation to figure out who's going to speak when. But this is a group of people who've been working hard on cooperating for quite a while now. So I think uh, I think they'll make it happen. Um, but the first thing I was wondering was if one of the editors wouldn't mind talking about how you came to the theme of BIPOC solidarities um, with this sort of part B uh, question as to how you feel the issue enacts BIPOC solidarities. So if one of the editors would be willing to take it away. Um, I think that um, in putting together this issue, that it's like a commitment to further those voices. And so that this the particular issue celebrates all those different voices, different perspectives. And yet it was interesting because I was going through the stories that I had pulled for the issue and was just writing down the similarity of themes and how different stories were and yet there were themes that were kind of consistent through a number of them. Um, but um, I know for myself, it's been an honor to work on this issue with, with um, you and the other editors. And I think we've put together something really special. So I can't wait for mine to come in the mail. Didn't realize it wasn't there yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is exciting, but it's still on its way. Um, would any of the other editors be willing to comment on the theme of BIPOC solidarities? I can say a little bit. Um, yeah, it's been really exciting getting to work on this issue. I think I've been at the Fiddlehead for eight or six to eight years at this point. I don't actually remember, <laughs> um, but uh, it's been really kind of a journey the whole time from when I entered um, kind of seeing the submission pile that we get um, at the editorial level with like some really fantastic like co-editors like Ian and Philip and Ross are all here and so for so many of those years I just remember us at every meeting being like who are we missing and like who are we not including in these issues um, and kind of creating that commitment to to kind of expand the reach of the fiddlehead to more BIPOC writers um, and it was difficult um, because there wasn't a lot of trust in a lot of places um, for especially a more established magazine that has kind of this history of publishing white writers and having mostly white editorial boards and figuring out how to share that power and share that um, space and invite BIPOC writers to feel invited and also safe like not, not like they're catering to an all-white audience is really important um, and it was a really a years-long process that I think really culminated in this issue as like a sort of new level we've reached of um, kind of having that invitation open and engaging those communities um, I know in my own work like I've talked to writers in my own community and in other BIPOC communities and kind of tried to create those that like level of trust of you know you're sending your work to a good space when you're sending it here to the fiddlehead and i think this particular issue was an extra exercise in that by having like sue originally i think the way you spelled out the meetings for this issue where you invited all the editors and kind of stepped out of the zoom room until the last five minutes in case we had questions so it was just a complete like handing over of power to an all all bipoc board of editors which was a new experience for me and it was really like humbling at first and also a little uncertain because not all of us knew what we were starting out to do or like how to go about the meetings and such but that theme really came out of all our discussions, I think. Um, trying to like make spaces where BIPOC writers can speak to our own communities and to each other and kind of find those common points in our experiences where we can join together in uh, seeking justice together and also in creating joy that isn't for a white audience, um, that is between 
people who are experiencing the same kinds of oppression or similar kinds of oppressions um, and kind of joining together that resistance and joy um, in a space that, that's by us and for us. And it was really fantastic to have the fiddlehead make room for that. And like as an editor and also just like a angry brown queer who's like always ranting about this stuff, I was so pleased to be part of this. And it's really like, I received the issue just a few days ago and have been just staring at it and like marveling that it's even possible. <laughs> so big thanks to all the fellow editors and I'll stop there for now. I just wanted to say, Rebecca, you know, to acknowledge that as one of the editors who's been around the longest at this point, just how important you've been in helping the fiddlehead to build that trust and um, change some of the ways that we've been going about doing things. So thanks. Um, so another question that I had in mind was, uh, after reading the introduction, I was thinking about what you've actually just said again, Rowan, about, uh, did you say, seeing conversations um, among the, uh, the pieces, conversations arose between the pieces you wrote. Um, and I thought it might be interesting to hear editors' takes on, like, an example of a conversation that you found arising between pieces or a theme that you found yourself tracing along, uh, along through different pieces. Or feel free to talk, continue to talk about the BIPOC solidarities as you will, but I'll just throw something else out onto the conversational floor, and see who picks it up. Um, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, I think um, the idea of BIPOC so solidarity sometimes immediately brings to mind like a shared experience of racialization and discrimination. So when I was thinking about this theme, what it meant to me was how, what do we share in this vast diversity of identities beyond that experience as defined by, by our relation to whiteness. So that is something that's very um, on my mind. So yes, we, we just saw a lot of pieces that we, we saw shared pain, shared anger, um, shared resistance, but each occupying their own search and their own histories and stories. So there are a lot of um, stories about family, um, about relationships. Mothers came up a lot. I always think that is, you know, if you ever have a writer's block to start writing about your mother and it'll, it'll just pour out. And so today I was, um, thinking more about this idea of solidarities and what it means to me to be in solidarity with other racialized, other people of color. And so I was doing research for a different project where I had interviewed um, a um, Blackfoot Ojibwe um, photographer. And so in his work, he incorporates a lot of, um, uses his powwow regalia. So I was doing research on, on powwow regalia and all the different dances and what are the parts of regalia and how I could connect with them, never having seen like powwow dancing. And then I thought, oh, I, I have I seen actually much traditional Chinese dance in my life? And I thought about it and like, oh, it was just Lunar New Year and what's traditional Lunar New Year is to have the lion dance. And that's something I always looked forward to. Um, I grew up next to Chinatown in, in Ottawa. Um, and I thought, yeah, that is a dance that, that I would love to see again. Um, and so I was, there's a lot about that dance I don't remember, I don't know about. And I started looking on YouTube and falling down another research hole and um, learning that a lot of the moves in lion dance are based on Kung Fu and that it takes years and decades to be um, become trained in line dancing and I thought oh this is such um, this is what solidarity means to me it's not that we have the same culture or that we have the same drumming or the same idea of spirit but that it's a side-by-sideness um, you know especially when we think of lion dances being performed on traditional territory um, and so that seems to me that the, the issue itself changed my idea of, of what it means to be in solidarity with other cultures is that we are all performing our own search for identity, learning more about our own cultures. And I felt that sense of desire and longing in a lot of the pieces that 
they were very specific in terms of, of writers writing about cultural practices, using languages, um, talking about spirituality and religion in a way that like we learn a lot as editors through the pieces themselves. Yeah. I think I tuned especially tuned in especially Phoebe to what you're saying about side by sideness because I feel like that's one of the things that a journal can really highlight, right? It brings this voice and this voice and this voice and this voice together and puts them side by side. And so, yeah, I'm just reflecting on the uh, the suitedness of a journal to this this idea of solidarity and side by sideness. Any other thoughts from the editors or should we leave it there and get into the readings? I can share just one more thing about that sort of side by sideness. Um, yeah. It was it was really like a, a learning experience, how Phoebe said it, um, about some of the practices and like cultural knowledge that aren't our own um, while we were going through these pieces. Like I know for me coming from a sort of unknown mixed race South American background and whatever complexities and controversies like Latin identity even is, um, I didn't see myself or my communities in any of the poems we received, but I still felt that kinship and that sort of like invitation into something that even if it's not for me, um, even if it's something specifically written for someone's cultural community in a very specific context and like has those in jokes, whether in untranslated language or in kind of like food names that I'm not familiar with, there's a comfort and a like a, a calling in there um, to be a part of it, to be a guest in those cultures and also to share kind of our parallel experiences of what overcoming colonization and racism and xenophobia and religious traumas of various kinds and sort of the um, complexity of being for a lot of immigrant families uh, and writers, settlers on a land that was stolen without our knowledge um, until late in life sometimes. Um, and trying to be in good relation, not just with those people who also came to this land kind of without knowing that kind of context or um, trying to kind of account for our own identity as settlers, uh, while also being in good relations with indigenous peoples who are the stewards of this land and who have been here kind of fighting that same fight that we find ourselves in a lot of the time. Um, so there was, I think that solidarity really came from those shared experiences that while they never look the same, they never have the same context, they all kind of have sort of a similar, like similar gestures of um, what you need to push back against, what you need to learn and unlearn, um, the way that language operates and loss of language operates, um, the way sort of invitations or exclusions in community operate. I know a lot of the, the pieces we received, and I think the first poem as well, uh, call into question that sort of dividedness when you're queer and racialized, like which community do you pick when those seem to be at odds? Um, and are you even able to divide up parts of yourself and be part of your cultural community while leaving out another part of yourself or vice versa? Um, so that kind of really complex, like, always operating navigation of identities in every scenario was something that was really shared across and uh, I think it really like demonstrated how powerful that is and how much of a skill that is across all of these writers like it's not easy to be constantly like navigating 50 different intersections of oppression and identity and various other things um, but we're doing it <laughs> and we're writing and we're creating something out of it. So that was, I think, what I really appreciated most was that that finding common ground and kind of struggling together and creating together through it all. I'm being asked in the chat to hold up the issue, so I'll do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for that, Rebecca. Um, I'm gonna say. 
I was I was struck by the choice because I wasn't involved in the ordering and I was struck by the choice to open the issue with a piece that was thinking very much about queer identity. So the very first gesture was to expand the solidarity beyond the BIPOC umbrella. Um, I thought that was a, a beautiful gesture. 